broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our second webinar in the Arbor Day series. My name is Gwen Kozlowski, and I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator with the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program. We have many friends of our program here uh, on today, uh, but for those of you who are new to us, the UCF team is a collaborative effort between UVM Extension and the Vermont Department of Forest, Parks, and Recreation. We provide technical, educational, and financial assistance to support communities in stewarding their trees, tree resources. And you can learn more about our work at vtcommunityforestry.org. Um, before I hand it over, we've got a few housekeeping items. Um, your microphones will be muted during the presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the question box in the side panel of the webinar. Uh, we will address these after the presentation. If you have any other comments or concerns, please feel, put, feel free to put those in the chat box. And credits. This presentation is eligible for one ISA, SAF, or Vermont Forester license at the CEU. To receive these credits, you must fill out the survey at the end of the webinar um, with your name and your license number. The survey will pop up once you exit the webinar and will also be emailed to you one hour after the, this presentation. So if for some reason it doesn't show up after uh, you close out of the webinar, it, it will be emailed to you one, uh, one hour later. Additionally, one item of note that's different from last week is that I'm trying to minimize the number of emails I send out to people after this webinar. So for those of you who would like an SAF certificate uh, for your SAF or Vermont Forester license, there's going to be a PDF certificate that you could download yourself without having me email it to you. So that'll be in the handout side panel of the GoToMeeting side panel. Um, again, if that doesn't work, just mark on the post webinar survey that you need to be e emailed the certificate and I'm happy to email that to you. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and available on our website later today, and I will also email that out to people who registered and attended. And we are so delighted to have so many of you on today. We have about 46 people uh, on today, and I know I had a comment to be able to show who else is on here, but unfortunately GoToWebinar doesn't make that information public, so I'm sorry about that. Um, and thank you to Savannah Ferreira, uh, Forest Health Specialist with the Vermont Department of Forest, Parks, and Recreation. Uh, Savannah's really, uh, we're, before I hand it over to Savannah, I'm going to get a quick, quick sense of who's in the audience. So I've got a few polls to launch. So I'm going to launch our first poll to see who is present today. And I'll leave this up for about 15, 20 seconds. So go ahead and select um, who you are, if you fit into one of those categories. All right, I'll give it another 10 seconds. All right, I'm gonna close that poll and we'll share out. We've got 36 here that are arborist forests or other arboriculture professional. Uh, we've got 45 just here to learn a little bit more, a few folks from municipalities, and a few volunteers. Great, thank you. And our next poll, Savannah will be covering um, beech leaf disease and several pine pathogens. Are these forest pests and diseases new to you? You've heard about them, but interested to learn a little bit more? I'm pretty familiar with the content, or I'm, I'm just here for the credits, and that's okay too. <laughs> We know that folks are um, struggling to receive credits, so I just thought I'd throw that in there for fun. I'll give this another five to 10 seconds. All right, I'm gonna close this poll and share out. Uh, a few of these, 21% uh, new to me, 74% I've heard about them, but interested to learn more, and a couple of folks that are pretty familiar with the content. And no one was brave enough to say they're here for the credits. <laughs> All right. So in our last poll, I'm just curious, what's your biggest pet peeve when listening in on a webinar? Technical difficulties, getting distracted by everyone else's background on a video call, a dog barking in the background, 
not sticking to the schedule or other. These are all of mine, so I put them up there and also put my dog in the office for right now. <laughs> Give it another five or so seconds. I know last week I did a poll on uh, how many people have participated in webinars and about 30% had participated in 10 or more and I give you guys a lot of credit. There's a lot of webinars to sit through. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close this poll and share out the results. Technical difficulties for sure, that, that ranks as one of my highest as well. All right, well, thank you so much for entertaining those polls. It's kind of fun just to see who's in the audience. Um, I will hand it over to Savannah and let's see, can we see your screen now? We can't, can we? Let's see. Hey Savannah? Yes. Okay, let's see. Oh shoot, I wanna close out these polls. <laughs> Talk about technical difficulties, that's a hoot. Uh, I think this is one of the problems when sharing polls. That's why I didn't do it last week. All right. <laughs> oh, this is this is fun. Shoot. Well, my box disappeared, so I am not sure what to do. I'm gonna change presenter and then switch back. Did it work? Let's see. There it is, okay. Thank you, Savannah, and sorry for the technical difficulties. I will not share those polls next time. <laughs> All right, remember to put your questions in the question box. All right, well, thank you for the introduction. It saves me some time in talking. So like Gwen just mentioned, I was asked to give a talk today primarily about pathogens that are concerned to white pine health, and I'll include white pine needle damage, Calisiopsis canker, as well as white pine blister rust. However, there is a growing interest within the tree health community about beech leaf disease. So I wanna quickly go over that and what we know about it so far. Because this is such a large topic uh, with many different facets, just please keep your questions till the end. So let's first start with beech leaf disease since the rest are pine pathogens. Beech leaf disease is a pest that affects both American and European beech that has not yet been detected in Vermont. The origin of this organism is possibly introduced from Japan. However, the exact location is unknown because the exact causal agent is not yet confirmed. Regardless, symptomatic beech was first detected in Ohio in 2012. The causal agent of beech leaf disease is thought to be caused by an introduced nematode as pictured here. However, there is evidence also supporting a bacteria as either the main or a significant contributing agent. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with what nematodes actually are, they're basically just microscopic worms. If you look at this picture here, this is actually uh, a scanning electron microscope image, which is why it looks so large. Um, and this was the nematode that was taken from symptomatic beech tissue. So here's a distribution map showing the current known locations of beech leaf disease, which includes Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, Connecticut, as well as Ontario, Canada. In total, this disease spans 41 counties. So although this might seem rather small and isolated, if you look at this legend on the right, you can see that it's actually been spreading at a pretty consistent rate since its first detection in 2012. In addition, you can see that the southeastern section of New York and the southwestern part of Connecticut does have more recent observations. They're that darker 2019 color. Now, is it possible that beech leaf disease is actually found throughout Pennsylvania and New York, and it just has gone undetected for this time period? Or is it possible that this is a brand new um, infestation and we have some unidentified vector. These are all questions that need to be answered. So what does beech leaf disease actually look like? Well, in the early stages of infection, beech leaves begin to develop a striping pattern between the leaf veins, which is shown in these two pictures here. 
Um, in more severe infections, the darker area has been observed as slightly raised and thicker than normal tissue. It almost has a leathery type texture. Um, this can obviously lead to leaf deformation. Over time, um, an infected tree is going to experience dieback, which starts in the lower branches of the canopy and progresses upwards. In younger trees, this disease progression is rapid, which leads to high mortality of saplings and understory beech. Studies have shown that symptoms actually do not progress throughout the growing season, which provides support for the hypothesis that nematodes are actually overwintering inside of the bud and affecting the leaves before bud break in springtime. Um, the nematodes being inside of the buds can also lead to aborted buds, which is easily noticed as empty or crispy buds at the end of an infected branch. So what does this look like on the stand level? Well, this disease is still in its early stages, so long-term impacts are still being researched. However, there is a high concern that mortality in saplings can potentially lead to species loss across the landscape. Without beech regeneration, there's also a potential for forest composition change, which will eventually affect all sorts of wildlife. Older trees are less affected. Um, they typically only have their lower branches being reported as infested, which is really good news because these large trees can still provide food and habitat um, for all these critters you see here on the screen, and there's so many more, as you all know, um, but it's also still able to produce seed. So maybe regeneration isn't completely lost. But if these older trees are eventually going to die of other causes, we can still see that replacement by non-beech trees. So what's currently being done to control or eradicate this disease? Currently, the only thing being done is research. The causal agent is still unknown, and without knowing what causes the damage, it can be impossible to know how to treat it. Like I mentioned earlier, the leading thought is that it is caused by a nematode. However, some studies have been able to confirm that bacterial populations actually differ significantly between symptomatic and asymptomatic leaf tissues. Also, there has been some pathogenicity assays that actually couldn't replicate the disease symptoms when they took a healthy beech tree and then inoculated it with this nematode. So again, because the causal agent is still unknown, it can be really hard to know how to control it. Several states have suggested the use of quarantines to slow the spread into new counties and states. However, because the causal agent is unknown, how do you really regulate this? Other studies are looking into increasing the genetic diversity of beech on the landscape um, and possibly even selectively breeding for resistance. Many of you know this already, uh, but beech trees, they really do love to sucker. Uh, so you have a tree that starts to sucker and it will just create more identical genetics across the landscape. Uh, this could either be favorable or unfavorable because it could lead to abundance of non-diverse genetics <clears throat> that actually um, increase the spread of beech leaf disease. So now I want to switch into white pine health and introduce you to a fungal complex we have here in Vermont called white pine needle damage. So white pine needle damage is a fungal complex of four different foliar fungi that have been associated with both needle cast and needle blight on eastern white pine trees. Although an increasingly damaging complex, individually these are not uh, pathogens that are documented as causal agents of large-scale defoliation. Although the origin of these fungal pathogens are not yet known, they have been a reported problem in New England since 2010. The spread of this complex is primarily through wind and rain splash and is usually more prevalent when we have warm and wet conditions. Before moving on, I just wanted to turn your attention to these pictures here on the right, where you'll see an infected tree as well as several pathogens. You may notice that Streptoides strobi is actually not here, and that's because it's a more recently discovered contributor to this complex, so there's less completed research on it. So each of these fungi in this complex has its own life cycle. However, all four of the fungi are Ascomycotas and therefore share a similar backbone to it. I don't really feel like it's necessary to go over all four, um, but I just wanted to quickly go over L. acicola's life cycle because it has been well documented and there's this really nice picture for it. <laughs> so if you remember on the last slide, this is actually a brown spot needle pathogen. 
So like many fungi, there are both asexual and sexual life cycles. Um, for L. acicola, spores are going to overwinter in the needles and ground debris. In the spring and early summer, fruiting bodies, um, either a cervuli or ascostroma, depending on whether it's sexual or asexual, are produced, and they're going to create spores. These spores are then going to be dispersed through wind and rain um, and infect new needles through their stomatas. The pathogen is then going to establish itself inside of the needle, colonize it, and complete this life cycle all over again. Depending on the time of the year, this could be the part in the life cycle where it can actually overwinter. But again, this is only one example. Other fungi in this complex, such as Aldoxy, actually fruit much later in the growing season, which kind of almost means that spores can be consistently um, produced, and constantly produced. Some studies have shown that white pine needle damage is more successful and prevalent if the previous year had increased humidity during these fruiting periods, because these spores that are traveling are able to stay more viable. So symptoms of infected trees consist of chlorosis, which is yellowing, and necrosis, which is browning, typically of your one-year-old needles. This is an interesting symptom because two of these fungi are actually blight pathogens, which typically have the yellowing and browning of the past year's needle and doesn't usually affect this year's growth. Regardless, this necrosis leads to defoliation, which is observed as thinned canopies, which can reduce the growth and overall health of the tree. This typically happens from the bottom of the tree to the top, um, similar to beech leaf disease, things that are usually foliar does progress in this manner. Um, here you can see growth reduction internally in this tree core. This tree core was actually confirmed of having white pine needle damage complex. And as you can see in 2010 to 2015, uh, it has a very sharp decline in annual growth. And 2010 is when we started seeing this problem in New England, like I mentioned earlier. Studies have shown that infections can occur on both mature trees and regeneration. In addition, trees most severely affected um, are typically trees that are growing already in less than ideal locations, such as the edges of bodies of water, in really wet areas, and on dry and steep slopes. So before moving on, I just wanted to show you all this graph from the USDA Forest Service publication on white pine needle damage. Here they document three of the four pathogens we're observing in Vermont and how commonly they were isolated in their New England monitoring plots, as well as the symptoms that they were observed with. <clears throat> Apologize, I'm losing my voice. As you can see, isolation of these pathogens, as well as symptoms, do vary within the growing season. We're going to have more B. linearis in April and more L. acicola in June. Again, this is because they complete their life cycles at different times of the year. In the next graph, you can see that necrosis happens early in the growing season, which is going to lead to high defoliation later in the growing season. And again, this should make sense because the tree is going to shed off all of those necrotic tissues. So what does white pine needle damage look like on the stand level? The answer to that depends on the severity of the infection. Although active throughout the year, this complex is significantly affected by the precipitation from the previous spring. If conditions were very wet, we'd be experiencing really high infection rates. Another thing to be mindful of is that needle damage generally affects the same tree each year. So when you have consistent annual defoliation, this can drastically deplete food resources and cause more severe dieback symptoms. A silver lining to this is the potential for genetic resistance or tolerance to this complex. If you look at this photo here, you'll see two pine trees of what we can assume a similar age class. One's actually infected with white pine needle damage, the other is not. Being wind and rain splash disseminated, it's really hard to imagine that this um, asymptomatic tree isn't showing any signs or symptoms, like it didn't have any spores land on it. So although great potential, um, obviously more research needs to be done in order to prove that resistance. So what's trying 
What's being done to try and control white pine needle damage? Well, the first is working on detection throughout New England. The Forest Service works with several states, including Vermont, um, in the region in monitoring crown health of 127 individual trees. In addition, there are efforts in both aerial and ground surveying to try to capture the overall damage, as well as scout new infections outside of the established monitoring plots. As I mentioned previously, uh, detections have been found in areas of poor growing locations, so active forest management may be a viable control technique. Managing trees for a preferred site will decrease predisposing factors and may actually help fungal growth continue. So when you have those really dense overstock stands, um, you're trapping in moisture and humidity and mold and fungi really love that. So if you look at this graph here, uh, you can see some studies that actually show that thinning to approximately 100 to 120 trees per acre reduces white pine needle decline severity. So I'll just leave that up for a second. So in Vermont specifically, we have been both detecting and managing our stands. <clears throat> In 2019, we mapped white pine needle damage on over 23,000 acres. This was a decrease from the 2018 growing season, uh, possibly due to the fact that we flew later in the season after much defoliation. Regardless, if you look at this graph here, symptoms were the most severe since monitoring began in 2012. We do predict that due to a wet and humid fall of 2019, we will see more affected acres as well as more severe symptoms in the growing season of 2020. So the next disease I want to talk about today is Calisiopsis canker, which is caused by the fungal canker pathogen Calisiopsis pinea. So this is a native fungal pathogen of eastern white pine, um, but it can affect other species of pine as well as several fur species. This fungi is typically asexual in nature, and is primarily rain and wind uh, dispersed. However, some studies have shown that asexual spores can be dispersed by small insects and animals, um, usually accidentally, but, no, but most notably by metacoccus scale. So this fungi is perennial, meaning that it's going to continue to grow and reproduce from the same infection for a few years. The fruiting body of this fungi is shown here, and it's very eyelash-like. This is called an ascocarp, um, but it's really the size and consistency of your eyelash. These fruiting bodies are typically produced in the spring and the summer. However, because they are so small, they're really easily overlooked in the fields. Calisiopsis is an opportunistic pathogen and usually needs other predisposing entry points to be, or extreme stressors in order to be um, highly virulent and cause lots of damage. Typically, new infections are going to occur through openings such as lenticels, insect wounds, such as from the metacoccus scale, um, or other damages or pruning. If you're interested in looking for Calisiopsis on the landscape, this is what you should be looking for. An affected tree is going to show one or a combination of outward symptoms, which includes excessive resin production. This typically happens between branch nodes and not from a noticeable wound. Over time, fungal infection can develop into noticeable cankers. If a tree does have the resources to be successful at compartmentalization, cross sections may reveal a pointed witch's hat type canker. The loss of resin and this development of cankers can lead to dieback. Um, and this dieback actually occurs typically from the tops of the branches down and also from the tips of the branches inwards. So, over time, wasting all of this resin, sacrificing that functional sapwood to compartmentalize, um, this is going to lead to mortality. So what makes trees susceptible to Calisiopsis infection? Well, like I previously mentioned, this is an opportunistic pathogen. So anything capable of reducing overall tree health and vigor is going to make your tree more susceptible. Environments that will decline tree health, including dense stands, excessively drained soils and soils with rooting barriers, all are going to predispose a tree to this type of pathogen. Not only will these factors make it worse for the tree, but environments like those dense and overstock stands, like I mentioned earlier, make the environment much more favorable for fungal growth. 
So what does this actually look like on the stands level or across the landscape? Well, reports indicate that throughout New England, there is high infection rates. However, mortality is low in our actively managed stands. This should make sense because again, this is a native pathogen. On the tree level, we have symptoms that affect crown density, which leads to negative impacts on lumber value. Depending on the severity and quantity, cankers will cause dieback and reduce the overall health and vigor of the infected tree. Over time, less vigor will mean less growth, which leads to less lumber that's actually produced. In addition, lumber is gonna be reduced in value by the presence of these cankers. This is because through compartmentalization, um, you're gonna lose a lot of functional sapwood. If you look at these pictures here, you can see both internal and external cankers. In pictures E and F, you can see that the actual canker is only this really small black line right here. Um, and all of the other resinosis around it is just the compartmentalization response. If you look at this last picture G, again, you can see that right here is the black area, that's the actual canker, the rest is compartmentalization. But that's actually a pretty substantial downgrade of that lumber. So how can we control this native pathogen? Well, the best thing to do is actively manage your stands. Reducing competition in those dense stands increases the overall tree health and vigor and makes the environment much less favorable for fungal growth. Some studies have actually shown that thin stands such as actually have smaller and less frequent cankers than our unthin stands. And this was a study in both uh, Maine and New Hampshire, so it was regional. Um, I actually have that paper if anybody was interested in it. <clears throat> in addition to managing your stands, try and target optimal soils and grow trees for their preferred sites. Doing this will help remove abiotic predisposing factors that opportunistic fungi, not just like Calisiopsis, there are other opportunistic fungi, um, and they all love to take advantage of this. I know not everyone listening today is a forester, but the picture shown here is of a stocking guide that's available in the field manual for managing eastern white pine health in New England. Uh, this can be used as an example of how to manage eastern white pine at a low density. So I wanna end the talk today talking about white pine blister rust. So this pathogen was actually introduced from Asia and is a fungal pathogen of both eastern white pine and currants. This is a basidiomycota and is a rust pathogen that requires two alternating hosts. In this case, they have, they're obligate or they have to be living um, in order to complete its life cycle. There are several spore stages in this life cycle However, they are all primarily wind and rain splash dispersed. So like I just mentioned, and I'm gonna mention on every single slide, uh, white pine blister rust is a rust fungi that needs two hosts. If you wanna follow this diagram from A to H, you'll see that spores from Arabes infect eastern white pine needles. These spores then colonize the needle and work its way down to the attached branch, which is on the main stem of the tree. Uh, there, this pathogen is going to asexually reproduce if it's early in its infection. Older cankers typically reproduce sexually. Um, these spores are then windblown to ribes, where they reinfect leaf tissue and eventually um, create a certain type of fruiting body that's able to reinfect eastern white pine again. And then this cycle continues. It is a really big and complicated life cycle, but I just wanted to focus your attention to two areas. Uh, because these are the most like, easily identifiable in the field. The first is springtime, you'll start seeing those blister-like fruiting bodies, they're known as acia. And then in the late summer, early fall, you'll start seeing uridia on your rivies. So like most rust pathogens, one of the infected hosts have mild symptoms, while one has much more severe symptoms. In this case, rivies does have the milder symptoms. Affected plants are gonna have yellowing and light necrosis due to the fungal pathogen colonizing its leaf tissue. Um, this is gonna ultimately reduce photosynthetic ability and maybe stunt its growth, but it's usually not severe enough to cause severe dieback or severe growth reduction. Unfortunately for most foresters and landowners, 
um, it's much more severe on eastern white pine trees. As you can see here, an affected tree is going to show one or a combination of these symptoms. We have the acia, which is the blister-like fruiting bodies and cankers. Um, this is actually happening at the branch nodes, not like Clisiopsis, that was between the two nodes. Um, eventually, you're going to start having resin soaking, again, because compartmentalization is happening and the tree is trying to pitch out this fungal pathogen. Uh, this will lead to girdling around these branch nodes. You'll start seeing needle spots and discoloration from where the infection first began, and then you'll start seeing dieback. And like most canker pathogens, dieback does occur from the top down um, and from the tips of the branches inwards. It is not uncommon just to see one single dead branch um, on a really healthy looking tree. Uh, that's just known as a flagging and that does happen. And if it's severe enough, this can lead to mortality. So what makes trees susceptible to this type of infection? Well, the biggest thing is the presence of the alternate host, which in this case is rivies. Both are going to be required uh, to complete its life cycle. If you remove one of the hosts, it literally cannot continue. The second is conditions favoring high humidity in the late summer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Environments that are warm and humid help fungal growth, and this would be the time of the year that the spores are produced that can infect eastern white pines. Some examples are listed here, such as the self-shading of lower branches, dew exposure and open-grown seedlings, as well as having those dense and overstocked stands. So what does this damage look like on the stand level or across the landscape? In smaller trees, we do see higher risk of mortality. Smaller, possibly younger trees are often covered by these mature cohorts. This shades them and creates that fun uh, favorable fungal condition um, that fungi really love to grow in. We're just essentially increasing humidity and moisture. In addition, the basidiospores that infect pine needles actually travel a much shorter distance from the needle to the main bowl of the tree compared to a larger mature tree. And then once it's at that main bowl, it's a much smaller surface area needed to girdle and ultimately kill the tree. In larger trees, we do have a higher risk of infection. These mature trees have larger crowns, which have greater leaf surface area to be infected by spores. You can think of a tree crown like a sail on a sailboat. Um, if you have a larger sail, you're going to capture more wind, and in that wind, more spores. Our larger trees are concerning because not only are these our valuable timber sizes, um, they are often left as seed trees after harvest. So if this tree is being girdled from this pathogen, you're going to be reducing its reproductive potential because the tree does die from the top down. So how do we control this pathogen? Well, eradication of the alternate host is a great way to reduce white pine blister rust presence. However, past eradication methods have varied in success rate. This can be a really time-consuming process and can be unsuccessful if ribes gets too established in an area. Currently in Vermont, we do not have an eradication program. However, other states like Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island all have been able to put in some type of statewide regulated program. Education is another great tool we can use. The biggest take home message would be to not plant ribes. As a state, we do have growing concerns about increased interest in locally grown and personal homesteading. Homeowners have the potential to drastically increase the presence of this rust pathogen by planting ribes to make their own jams. At the very least, we can continue to actively manage our stands and grow trees for their preferred sites just so we can help increase overall health and vigor. I just wanted to quickly elaborate on our past control efforts in the state. Again, currently we do not have a quarantine in Vermont against ribes, although in the past it has been considered. Um, here's an older regulation on white pine blister rust control in the state that states that black currant is banned from being planted or grown in the state, and then it later ex um, extends that regulation to cover all ribes species. So unfortunately, I don't have a clear timeline on what happened to this order. But again, ribes is not currently banned in our state. I did also just want to show some vegetation plots that were established in Vermont and show the overlap of ribes and eastern white pine. Um, and this is just to reiterate that we do have both hosts in the states, 
and we should all be able to continue to look out for this pathogen because it is introduced it's not native and with that i apologize if i talked really fast it's hard to gauge an audience when you're talking to a computer screen uh, but i do have some time left over for questions if you have any Thank you so much, Savannah. That was a whirlwind tour, but so much information. And, and we do have a, a couple of questions already coming in. So now's the time in that question bar box, type in your questions and we have some time to answer those. Just to reiterate, we do have uh, this webinar will be recorded and available on our, our website later today. And I can also email that out to, to folks. Um, and let's see, we've got a few questions already rolling in here. Um, this one's from Ryan. Does removal of infected branches help con control the spread of the blister rust? So unfortunately, um, it's kind of a loaded question because if you're already seeing an infected branch, it's already at the main bowl of your tree. So it would be removal of the entire tree and then um, properly disposing of that tree uh, just to get the fruiting bodies because even though the tree is alive, when you cut it down, um, it's going to take a little while for the fungi to realize that the tree is ultimately dead, so it can continue to produce spores. Okay, um, let's see. Is the alternate host needed by wildlife? So for, there are several Ribe species that um, are native to North America, and they are definitely utilized by wildlife um, because they're native. They've grown up with a lot of things that are in our area. Mm -hmm. They do have a really nice berry, uh, which is why it's utilized for jams. And following up on that, uh, a friend of mine just found a ribes in her woods, but she doesn't have a white pine nearby. Is there a range that you know of that both hosts need to be within a certain proximity? Um, I would have to get back on the specifics. I think I read somewhere that around six miles um, is what you want to be on the lookout for. Okay. But I mean, it's wind dispersed, so yeah. wind could be pretty far. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Margaret. How does stance uh, species diversity affect success, 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 um, susceptibility excuse me, to, uh, to these diseases? So that is, how does stand species diversity affect susceptibility to these diseases? Does a more okay, diverse well, forest have more resistance to these issues? Well, starting with beech leaf disease, um, right now, if we had a more diverse forest, they probably wouldn't be spreading as quickly as they are in the surrounding forests in Ohio and New York. Um, for white pine needle damage, Yes, again, you're creating a wind-blown spore. So if you have less white pine trees in an area, you're going to have less white pine pathogens. Uh, the same goes for Calisiopsis. This can travel from pine tree to pine tree. So it is, um, it is important to have species diversity. However, a lot of times when you're managing uh, some nice timber stands, there's a lot of white pine, sometimes in New England. So that can be hard to do. Uh, white pine blister rust, however, this doesn't matter as much. Um, white pine blister rust, once it's infected in the pine tree, it can only then affect Aribes. It doesn't spread from pine tree to pine tree, so it doesn't matter as much. Interesting. Um, and following back up on that, is there a way to treat Aribes plants to prevent infecting trees? No, there is not. Um, some I want to, I don't want to say studies, but some organizations have claimed to have uh, ribes that are resistant to white pine blister rust. So they're uncapable, they don't have the gene that uh, allows that fungal pathogen to be um, colonized inside of itself. However, once you plant these species, um, they can easily breed and cross hybridize with native or non resistant varieties. Mm, okay. So don't believe uh, all their advertising is the rule of thumb there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> next question, does pine bark mulch have the ability to spread these diseases? No. So all of these diseases actually uh, require living host. So once it gets chipped up and it's dead for a while, 
um, it's not going to have any viable spores left. Excellent. Does it have to be heated to any temperature or it just has to be a live host? A live host. Perfect. If um, you're going to be traveling out of the state and region, um, I don't want to just say that you can do that. Uh, there's definitely regulations on that, that it will be heat treated. Okay. And can a single white pine have all four of the pathogens that you had mentioned? It can have three. It cannot have beech leaf disease. Okay. Great. Uh, are there any more questions? We'll hang on for a few more minutes to type those away. I um, am so thankful to Savannah's time, energy, and efforts. Um, she's She started here in, um, in January, and she's been on a whirlwind uh, tour of webinars and sharing her information, so we're very appreciative of her. Um, for those of you, again, who are looking for an SAF certificate, check out the handouts. Um, on handouts bar on the GoToWebinar panel, and you could select the VT Arbor Day webinar series. Go ahead and select that, and it should start downloading on your computer. Um, again, if you need to uh, get emailed that, that's totally fine. Just put that in the survey. Um, and with that, we've got one one more question from Margaret. Are, are forest management plans or town forest management plans starting to include plans to manage these diseases or should they? Um, they definitely should be. I don't want to speak on behalf of them, um, but these are pathogens that we've been aware of now in Vermont for some time. Um, again, we don't have beech leaf disease, so we're just focusing on these three pathogens of pine. Um, 2010 is when we first started seeing them in the region for white pine needle damage. Clisiopsis was like 2012, and white pine blister rust has been for a very long time. <laughs> so these are things that our foresters are definitely keeping an eye out for. We also have protection foresters that they can go and ask questions about um, and help with that management plan. Excellent. And with that, I'll say thank you for everybody's time. Thank you again to Savannah. And uh, feel free to fill out the survey for CEU credits or to give us feedback. Uh, thank you very much. Have a good rest of your day.